Hello everyone and welcome back to Think Outside the Board. I'm your host Brian Tui. If this is your first time here, then simply welcome. So today I'm doing a first impressions video on Curious Cargo. It's a tile placement and action point game from designer Ryan Courtney and Capstone Games with art by Quan Chai Moria. Uh, it plays two players exactly and the box says it's 30 minutes to an hour. I might adjust that to an hour to two hours because it is kind of a crunchy, puzzly game with really good choices. And uh, in my experience, I don't think it's gonna play quite as quickly as the publishers maybe think it will based on what they put on the box. So Ryan Courtney has also directed Pipeline, which I backed on Kickstarter. It has a similar kind of uh, puzzly tile placement, polyomino mechanic, although that one is more of a heavy Euro where you're building a pipe network, but you're also engaged in kind of Euro mechanics uh, building up a whole system and it's it's a much bigger larger game much more complex game and it's for two to four players this is also a polyomino game but it's smaller and it's designed just for two players and the gameplay is uh, much more kind of focused now the art on this is from Quan Chai Maria who is an amazing artist he has worked on Catacomb second edition cryptid uh, dinosaur island dulasaur island in the hall of the mountain king Preda Porte, the most recent version that was on Kickstarter, I think that's the third edition. Uh, the new version of Sidereal Confluence, which came out fairly recently, I believe that's the second edition, and uh, Under Falling Skies. He has just such great stylized art. It's really appealing, and I think it elevates any game that he works on. And then finally, this is published by Capstone Games. And Capstone Games has been just killing it lately. They've been putting out so much good stuff. The stuff of theirs that's in the Board Game Geek's Top 1000 includes Arkwright, Bus, which I guess they've now picked up the rights to, uh, Cooper Island, Crystal Palace, The Estates, Gaia Project, which they've now picked up the rights on that as well, uh, Glass Road, Irish Gage, Orléans, which they've just acquired that one as well, uh, Maracaibo, Terra Mystica, and Watergate. So they've just been publishing a bunch of really good games lately, and I think that their success has allowed them to acquire some other really good uh, titles and IP. So I think you should expect to see continued really solid stuff coming out of Capstone. They are just, they are, they're rapidly becoming one of my favorite publishers with the quality of stuff that they're continually publishing. Curious Cargo was published in November 2020. It's for two players exactly, so there's not a solo mode in this, so just know that. You can't play a solo version because there is not one. It is exclusively for two players. It's a medium heavy game, and it involves action points and tile placement. Now, again, this is a first impressions video, so I'm not gonna do a full teach, although I'm gonna get actually kind of close to it, and I'm not gonna do a full review, but I am gonna show you the mechanics of the game and how they kind of work, and then I will tell you what I thought of the game, my first impressions after playing it a couple times. So let's go over to the board and take a look at how it plays. Okay, so I have the board set up down here for the game for this player, but I haven't put the components on the player mat over there at the far end. I don't think you need that to get an idea of the game. Essentially, you'll play this game in rounds, each round consisting of two phases, the construction phase and the shipping phase. And they're very kind of simple phases, but the way that this game builds on itself is really fascinating and creates a lot of complex decisions. So during the construction phase, you're going to take this bag this curious cargo bag, and you have three actions. So you can either draw some tiles out of this bag, or you can place them on your board. And you can do those in any combination up to three. So if I draw, let's say, two tiles, and I place one, that's my three actions. Now, if I, let's say I draw three tiles, and so I have no actions left. I just have these three tiles at the end of my turn. At the end of your turn, you'll have to place all of your tiles into this storage container. And once you've placed them, you cannot change their order on a future turn. So it's important when you're placing these to, you know, look at them, figure out which one you might want to use, and maybe put that one at the top and put your other tiles underneath it. Like if I had three, I could put my third tile in this other side. And then on a future turn, if I get tiles, I either need to decide to play things from the storage before I place these tiles out, or these tiles on a future turn will just get put on top of these. Now, everybody is going to start with three of these cards. Uh, they will pick one and keep that and give the other two to your neighbor. 
and then you will get two cards from your neighbor. So these actions that have to do with pulling tiles out of the board and placing them out here to build your network, this is the construction phase. And when you're playing these cards, this will be the trucking phase. Now on the trucking phase, you're gonna do one of three things. You're either gonna use this action to get a card, and that will be your whole trucking phase, or you're going to take one of these cards and discard it to get this many tiles. So generally these smaller uh, trucks that are only one AP, which is an action point, will have a large number of tiles. So these are cards you'll probably want to turn in to get extra tiles. So I would just discard it into a discard pile, take three more tiles out of the bag, and then slot them on top of my storage. So that's the second thing that you can do in the trucking phase. The third thing that you can do is spend up to two AP. So if I still had this card, I could use both of these cards spending AP to pull trucks out. Uh, or I could just spend maybe two AP to put a big truck out. So every truck over here that you're seeing on, on this side corresponds specifically to a card. They're all different, either by the symbols or the number of blocked spaces they have. So if I spend this using my two AP to put this truck into action, I'm gonna look, I'm gonna find that exact truck, and here it is, and I'm just gonna slide it in to my player board like this. And that's the trucking phase. So you've got your construction phase and you've got your trucking phase and hopefully that's all very clear. But you may say, Brian, what the heck are you trying to do here? <laughs> What's the purpose of all this? Well, you are taking these weird little goods and you're trying to get them into your trucks and you're trying to ship them off. So I am building, I'm using these tiles to build a network of pipes that leads from these machines over to the side of the board. Also, when you're playing tiles, you also have these scaffolding tiles that you can work with. Now, you have five of these at the start of the game. And the idea here is that you're making this very kind of complicated series of pipe networks. Even though this is a 2D kind of looking down version, this is still a three-dimensional pipe work uh, grid. So the idea here is that I can place tiles on top of tiles, but I can't have them overhang. So for instance, if I wanted to play this, place this tile on top of this tile, I would need to put one of my little scaffolding tiles that is thematically propping up my pipe network system, and then I could put this tile on here. And what I'm doing over time is I'm building a grid of pipes from all of these machine hookups, hopefully to this side of the board. So if I did this, I would have now created a red pipe network that goes over here into this five spot. What that means is anytime I put a truck down here, if this five spot is open, so for instance, maybe I got um, another truck. This is like a three truck, it has three spaces, so it has two storage spaces in the cab. So if I were to play another card, another trucking card, and put this here, it's gonna move this up like this. And once I've done this, automatically, this is just going to export a good along this pipe to an open space on my truck. Now, there's a rule that says that you can't put a good into a blocked space, so that's never gonna happen. There are also rules that say if you're using a truck, let's say like this one that has lots of open spaces, the same colored good cannot be touching, so it can't be directly adjacent to each other. But you're gonna be building a grid of pipes that go over into these areas so that as you're playing these cards down, you are shipping out your goods. And these will keep moving. And anytime I play another truck so that this truck gets moved so that it's overhanging the top of my board, it's going to get pushed all the way over here like that. And if it so happens that my opponent here has a pipe system going over to this side of their board, which would be the same side as this side, so, I'm gonna be trying to import goods on trucks that are being pushed along this line, and he'll be trying to import goods along my trucks that are getting pushed along this line. So if this truck ever gets pushed up so that it connects with a pipe network that is built, that is of the same color, this player will drip, 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 import this good and put it here on their import area of their player board. Now, whenever you import a good to cover up one of these icons, you are going to get that good. And the same will happen on the player board. So there are these construction token icons. So whenever I place a tile that would cover one of these things, I will immediately get that 
token. In this case, it would be a construction token. Um, you also may get things over here for the turn order board, and that will be determined at the end of each phase by looking at how many connections you have on your player board. And you'll move your player token up on this board to that number of connections. Now, if you end up covering up some of your connections during the game, that's okay, this will never go down. So this is always depicting the most connections you had at any one time. And if you are to land, say, here in the three space, this will also give you a construction token. There's a little bit of a catch-up mechanism, so the second player to get there will actually get two construction tokens. And then a lot of the other rewards up here are for cards, so you'll just get to take more of these trucking cards. Also, let's talk about the tokens in general. So anytime I get one of these tokens, I can spend one of them on my construction phase. That's the one where I'm taking tiles and playing tiles, and that will give me two more actions. So a total of two more tiles I could either draw from the bag or place out. I can also, if I have two of these, I can turn them in and take a trucking token. Now this trucking token will be used during the trucking phase, and if I turn that in, I'm gonna to get to draw an extra card here, and then I will be obligated to use at least one of my two action points on playing a card, which means if I do that trucking action, I won't get to take this action, that same trucking phase, and I also won't get to take a trucking action where I turn in card a card to get more tiles. So, I'll play the trucking token, I'll get an extra card, but then I will be obligated to use at least one of the two point uh, AP for loading in trucks. I'll kind of be obligated to do the, the truck loading action that turn. And that will cost one token to turn this in. Now if I've acquired two of these tokens, I can again turn in two of these tokens to get a splitter. And a splitter is very unique because all of the tiles in the game, they may have pipes that kind of of the same color that go through each other, but they go, you know, kind of under or over. They don't actually connect like this does. So if I play this one, I could have something going into this pipe and then I could chip out from all three different angles. So this actually is a very important tile if you're going for one of the kind of stars that will help you win the game. But that is essentially the gameplay. You're going to be building a network of pipes to help you ship out goods, as well as a network of pipes connecting on this side to help you import the goods that your opponent is shipping out. So let's talk about how to win this game. First of all, there's the player board that I've been showing you with two goods on it. If you play the advanced version though, you're gonna be playing with three different goods. And whichever board you're playing with, you need to ship off at least two goods of each type to be able to qualify to win the game. So in this one, the advanced game, you're gonna to have to ship out two of the blue, red, and purple goods. And that's kind of notated by this yellow area here on the side. So if you don't ship out at least two of each good, you just, you can't win the game, you're gonna lose. And if the game ends before either player does that, then they're going to share the loss together, okay? And over here on this board, you can see I've got the same yellow line and I need to ship out at least two of the blues and two of the reds to qualify for end game points. Now, once I've done that, I can win the game. And to win the game, the thing that I wanna do the most is get stars. And there are only two ways to get stars in this game. You can either get to this end track, this 10, 10 spot on the turn order track. Now to do this, this means that you'll need to have made at least 10 connections simultaneously at any point during the game. Now, on most of these player boards, you're gonna see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hookups per machines. So that means that even if I were to hook up all of these machines to the, to the outside, that's only eight hookups, which means that if you wanna get this star, you really are going to need to get a splitter. That will increase the number of hookups that you can do by two. So one splitter will allow you on this board to get 10 connections. But remember, to get that splitter, you're gonna to have to turn in two of these to get a trucking token, and another two of these to get a second trucking token, and then two trucking tokens to get a splitter. So the cost to acquiring it is four construction tokens, but wait, there's more. To play the splitter, you need to spend a fifth construction token. So getting these are not cheap, and it means that you're going to be not using these construction tokens 
during the game very much. And remember, these construction tokens, that's the way that you're going to get more tiles and place more tiles. They'll give you two more actions during that construction phase. So in order to try to get this splitter, to get this spot on this track, you're gonna to have to forego a lot of extra tile actions to do that, so you're making a choice. So the other way that you can get a star is if you import a maximum number of goods in any one color, so either four blue, four red, or if you're playing on the advanced board, you can also do it with four purple. Uh, and that just means that this other player has to be exporting a lot of that good, and you have to have your import pipeline setups in such a place that it's going to catch a lot of that stuff. And sometimes during the game, you can move around the pipe a little bit, placing more tiles uh, to try to get something that maybe isn't going to align with the area where your, your pipe network is already connecting. But that is the way that you do that. You score a star from here or a star from either of the imports maxing these out. Now, if any player has scored a star at the end of the game, then the player with the most stars will win. If no player has scored stars, then it will default to points. And points are basically determined by the numbers that you see on the boards. So I'm going to score the highest number point for each good I have. So if I've only imported, let's say one green, I'm gonna score four points. Let's say I'd imported three greens and two reds, then I'm gonna score nine points for the green and seven points for the red. As far as export goes, you'll see over here the numbers. If I export up to you know two, three, four, five, or six goods of any one type, I'm going to score up to two, four, eight, nine, or 10 points. And then way over here on the right side of this, if I were to ship, let's say five goods of each type, so these are all gone, then I will score nine points for the blue, nine points for the red, and I will score a column bonus of two points. And these points will then determine the winner. But again, that will only happen if no player has earned any stars and if all players have shipped out at least the minimum of goods. So that's the way the game plays. Two phases, construction and shipping, and you're just gonna do them back and forth. At the end of each phase, you will adjust these turn order markers. And then once the bag has run out of tiles, the deck has run out of cards, or you ship a cargo limit. So in this case, in the, in the smaller game, you have to ship a total of nine cargo. In the advanced game, you have to ship out a total of 12 cargo. So as soon as either player does that, that will also trigger the end game. And as soon as a player scores a star, that will also trigger the end game. Now, however, it's very unlikely that both players will score stars because the other player doesn't get to finish out a turn after one player triggers the end game. So the only way players could really both get stars would be if on their turn, when they got a star, the player did something to trigger maybe goods getting exported. So that filled up the other player's import level to the max and they also scored a star. But that's gonna be kind of a rare situation and there will be no way for the other player to get an extra turn to try to score a star also. It will either happen on this player's turn while they're doing things or it just won't. So in most cases, just one player will be scoring stars. But that's Curious Cargo and that's the way it looks on the table, that's the way it plays. And it's a, it's a pretty cool, tight little puzzle game. I really like this game. Uh, this game for me is really what I want in a smaller two player game. Uh, it has really good choices and I think complex choices. So even though it's a two player game, it's a smaller box and it's a smaller footprint on the table and the box says you can play it in 30 to 60 minutes. It is not a light game, it is not a simple game. You're still gonna be able to sit down with this thing and have a really good, chunky, meaty <laughs> tile placement polyomino experience. Uh, it's, it's really solid and it delivers a lot of really good gameplay for your buck and for the game size. And anyone who likes polyominoes, who likes tile placements, I would, this, this is a hard recommend for me. It just excels at the genre of game that it is. But if you don't like that genre, so it is, right? If you do like this, if you do like, you know, polyomino three-dimensional kind of puzzly games, I think you're gonna love this one. So there are a few kind of uh, standout elements of the game I think I should mention in talking about why I like it so much. So when I was showing you the game on the table, I showed you what's considered to be the, the starter player boards, the, the boards that you wanna use for your first game. And whenever you're picking a board, you're gonna use the same board for both players so that they're dealing with the same situation. 
However, there are basically 10 different boards you can choose from. So there are a total of 10 boards total. They're all double-sided, so that's 20 sides divided by two players because there's doubles for each. That's a total of 10 different unique boards you can play when you're playing this game. Now, I could probably play one board for quite a while before I got too bored with it because the game is that good and it has that much variability. So if you're choosing from 10 different boards, ugh, that feels to me like you're gonna have almost unlimited replayability. I can't see 10 different boards really ever going stale and there's no reason they couldn't put out another board pack down the line. Just like, you know, a thin little package with maybe half a dozen boards that would give you six more boards to choose from. And that would extend the variability, but I don't think that even is ever going to be necessary considering how much choice you already have. And then on top of that, you've got the player board with two sides, right? You've got the regular game and the advanced game, and the advanced game throws in another resource. Now they tell you in the rule book not to play that advanced game until you've become proficient at the more simple two resource game. However, I played the advanced game on my second game, and I didn't really think it was any more complicated. Um, yeah, you're throwing another resource into it, and so when you're using those tiles that you're pulling out of the bag, you're gonna be using the backs of the tiles, which include red, blue, and purple pipes instead of just red and blue pipes. Uh, so I suppose in theory, you might think that it's gonna be more complicated, but I found that that's not the case. I think having three things and three different tiles to choose from gives you a little more room to maneuver. And the other thing I noticed is that when you're using the sides with the purple tiles, what seemed to me to be significantly more tiles with straight pipes in all colors. And I think that kind of counterbalances uh, the complexity of having an additional resource. By having a lot more straight pipes, it allows you to do things more cleanly from time to time and not have to deal with as much you know, pipes kind of leading all over the place. And so, at least in my opinion, you know, from a first impression, it seems like the complexity that is increased by adding in a third resource is then also decreased by having pipes that are a little easier to work with. But I like both of those things, and I like how much variability they give you in the game. And as I've said, I've already really loved this game. I think this is probably the number one two-player game in my collection that I would keep. So if I had to get rid of everything else, I probably would keep this one. It's that good in my opinion. Um, and the other thing I think that's really helpful are those little scaffolding tiles. So if you ever paint yourself into a corner where you know, you've got an opening with just one square or you wanna place a tile on top of another tile kind of overlapping, those scaffolding tiles are kind of a godsend to help you adjust your scaffolding pipe build. There are a couple things I think in the game people may not love and none of them really bothered me, but let's mention them in case these would be a hang up for somebody. So, I mean, first of all, it's just the nature of the game, right? If, if you don't like this kind of very tight polyomino puzzle, this is not gonna be the game for you. Uh, also is the fact that there are non-reversible tiles. And what I mean by that is because the tiles are two-sided and one side is sort of the day version with the two resources and the other side of the tile is the night version that also includes purple resources, that means that each side of those tiles is very specific to the version that you're playing and you can't flip the tile over and use the reverse side. Right, So in a lot of polyomino games, the tiles are the same on the reverse side, or sometimes they're even see-through. And so when you flip them over, you basically reverse the kind of pipe that you're using. So if you have a pipe that maybe has this kind of a wave on it, when you flip it over, you might get the reverse wave, and it gives you more ability in how you place. So this game does not have that ability because the tiles are already double-sided with different iconography on the other side to use for the other version of the game. So just know that. And then finally is the scoring system. So having played it a couple times, it, it doesn't bother me and I think it doesn't bother me just because I enjoy the game so much. But in theory, I think the scoring system is not something that I would choose and some people may be very hung up on it. And by that, I'm talking about the fact that you have to ship out two of each good to even be able to qualify to win the game. And then there's that weird kind of rule where if anyone gets stars, whoever has the most stars will win the game. And if no one gets stars, then you default to points 
assuming you both shipped at least two goods of each kind. So it's a weird kind of fiddly, archaic method. It, it doesn't feel user-friendly, but I think when I try to think about it from a designer point of view, I understand that Ryan Courtney probably wanted to place priority on this prerequisite of shipping out a certain amount of goods or you can't win, and then also having certain score uh, opportunities that he considers to be tougher to achieve, like the 10 turn track and the importing a maximum number of goods so that if a player has done that, they automatically win. So I think that's the goal he wants players to go for, and he set it up so that if you do that, you're pretty much guaranteed the win, and then the point system is a default. It's just a little weird. It's a little fiddly. Uh, I can see some people not liking it because there's this a barrier where no one could win the game, players could lose together, and that's not necessarily fun and a little odd. Uh, and then the star thing is a little weird too, but it's fine. The gameplay itself, I think, is the star here, and the scoring system will work. It just may not work to somebody's liking, but for me, it doesn't actually compromise the gameplay or my enjoyment of the game. Now, all of that said, the good and the bad, in my opinion, the, the thing to come back to is just how good a polyomino game this is. It can be very take that and it can be cutthroat because you can do things like play your card to put a truck into your opponent's queue. And you might do that if you want to push a good into your import lane right where you want it, or you just kind of want to screw with how they have things set up. So there are ways in this game, I think, that you really kind of can't screw with each other. And to me, that's just another mechanic in the game and another feature of the gameplay, which I like. But again, the take that element, some players may not love it. I know there are a lot of Juve Rosenberg two-player games that are kind of adaptations of his chunkier Euros. Like Lahav has a two-person version called the Inland Port and Agricola and Caverna both have two-player games. And he's also produced Patchwork. And all of those games come in a box that is the same size as Curious Cargo. I think Watergate comes in the same size box and Seastead, which is sort of a two-player version of Flotilla. Now, out of all those games, I haven't played Watergate yet, but out of the rest of them, Curious Cargo is my favorite. And I think if I had to choose between Patchwork and this, I would choose this. That's a pretty high recommendation. And I also know that a lot of people know Patchwork and have played Patchwork. I think that's a, a reference point that a lot of people may be able to make the connection with. Uh, so yeah, I would keep this over Patchwork. That's a high compliment, I think. Now, in terms of giving the game a rating, uh, I usually do throw out a rating in my first impressions videos. Sometimes when I do a first impressions video, I know I'm probably gonna wanna come back later and do a full teach and review. And so that first impression score can be a little vague or mutable, you know? Um, but I think with Curious Cargo, it, it's pretty solid in my mind. I don't think that score is gonna change. And because the game is kind of simple mechanically, I don't anticipate doing a full teaching review anytime soon. So let's just kind of lock in my score for this one right now. And I am gonna give Curious Cargo a nine, which is, which is pretty high. I mean, I, I haven't been giving out a lot of nines lately. So this game came out in 2020. And what that means is that when I go to do my top 25 of 2020, which will be coming in the next couple months, Curious Cargo is gonna be pretty high. I, I think it's almost guaranteed that it'll be in the top 10 if I'm giving it a nine. So again, that is a fairly high rating and that should indicate to you that this is a game that I, I really like and I very much recommend. So that is it for this video, for this first impressions video. Stay tuned for first impressions videos coming for both Merv and Kanban EV, as well as a Kickstarter update that will cover the first half of July. So that's games that will complete their funding in the first half of July. And that will be coming uh, probably in about a week's time. <laughs> so, so theoretically that needs to get published before the 1st of July. But I will say this, there are so many issues happening right now with shipping on Kickstarter, uh, both in games that funded a long time ago and are trying to get on the boats right now, and campaigns that are trying to launch right now, getting you know insane estimates of shipping being five times what they normally are. And so it seems to me that a lot of big companies right now are not 
putting their Kickstarter or not launching their Kickstarters, but are maybe taking a wait and see method for the next month or two or three to get a better idea of where the whole shipping situation is going to go. And what that all boils down to is that my early July Kickstarter update will probably be much shorter than normal. I think right now, in terms of me having kind of looked at it and seeing what's gonna be on there, I'm guessing there won't be more than half a dozen games, which is probably half of what I usually have. So it will be a shorter video to get at. It will be a quicker watch. And I'm anticipating that the next few Kickstarter updates for July and August may follow suit. There may be fewer Kickstarters launching right now while the shipping crisis is kind of at its peak, hopefully. Hopefully it doesn't get worse. So that's it. Those will be the next three videos you'll be seeing over the next week, week and a half. Once again, thank you very much for watching this. I hope my video helped you make a decision about whether Curious Cargo is for you. I think if you like this kind of game, it's gonna be a big hit. And if you don't, then probably not. But for what it is, it is very well designed, it's very well produced, and it is a big winner in my book. Have a great weekend. I hope you're getting in as much gaming in whatever way you can right now. And I will see you soon with the first impressions video for Merv, the heart of the Silk Road. Take care. Mm -hmm.